welcome to video clip 1.2 in the course 2160 online learning theories and models. This video clip discusses the variances from traditional higher edu education courses that this course has. Jumping right into the analysis questions, I'd like you to think about what types of variances have you encountered before in your different educational contexts, some of the distinctions between synchronous and asynchronous technologies, and the added value or the extra component when you add a learning community to a learning experience. And finally, just start thinking about authentic assessment and how would you describe that in your own words. So jumping right in, synchronous and asynchronous technologies. You'll notice that in this course and indeed in this program, it's a blend. A blend of both synchronous and asynchronous. So let's start with talking about what that is. Our asynchronous are online resources that are used to facilitate information sharing and they're not constrained by time or place. So in the context of this course, this would include your Blackboard discussion forums, being able to access your video clips, the readings, the PowerPoints, that sort of thing. In the synchronous environment, these are resources that are used to facilitate information sharing, but you need the same virtual space at the same time. So examples in this course would include our Adobe Connect tutorial sessions. The vast majority of currently available online programs and courses in higher ed and K-12, and to some extent corporate, uh, make use of asynchronous technologies. So for example, email, discussion forums, using the wall on Facebook. Each of these technologies allows a user to post information to a networked site so at a later time that information can be accessed by other users and responses can be made. These types of technologies are very worthwhile because they allow communication between individuals and within groups and they allow time for deeper reflection because you can take time between receiving a message and responding to it. For this reason, this course makes use of asynchronous technologies when we need higher order thinking skills such as analysis, synthesis, evaluation, and creation. Learning using online synchronous technologies includes such things as instant messaging, video conferencing, um, other same time, same space technologies such as Skype or Adobe Connect. And this has the potential to support learners in the development of learning communities. Synchronous online learning is reported as being more social in nature than asynchronous and avoids the frustration by allowing for conversations to happen in real time. Video conferencing gives the added benefit of being able to detect and decipher facial expressions and allowing for greater nuancing of the interactions. Recently, with innovations such as Google Wave and the real-time collaborative text editing in Google Docs, the line between synchronous and asynchronous technology is being blurred. The power of synchronous communication in, in the fairly traditional email and document writing ac applications has transformed them into incredibly powerful collaborative tools. Many of these tools can be used in this course, such as Google Docs, Twitter, Skype, YouTube, Prezi, CMap. Um, even in Blackboard, there are some tools that can function synchronously, like the chat. One of the intents in this program is to support the development of learner intellectual independence. And this really focuses on self-directed learning. It's similar to what's experienced when you're learning to ride a bicycle. The supports are gradually removed until the bicycle rider is left to progress on their own. In the context of this course, this course will start with a fair amount of support available in the tutorial, in the asynchronous sessions, but as the course progresses, more and more of that support will be removed until you, the learners, are directing your own learning. And that's really evidenced in the problem-based learning pieces. The graph on this slide suggests that as the teacher, the professor, or the TA direction increases over time, more and more of the responsibility for learning moves to the student. This may be very different than what you have experienced to date in higher education courses. However, it's really one of the cornerstones around problem-based learning and one of the cornerstones around self-directed learning itself. One of the other pieces that's critical to having an effective and, and rewarding online learning experience is the development of a community of learners. 
The activities in this course expect that you will participate and grow and develop this cohort, this community of learners. And it's based on the ideas by Etienne Wagner and Jean Lavey around communities of practice. Here's a quick example of the implications of investigating the development of community of learners. And the quote is taken from an interview, which you can access on the link bef below. Here's a little bit of an example that Etienne discusses. The community of learners concept has become a cornerstone for social learning theory. Through participation in a community of practice, you can see learning not only as the acquisition of information and skill, but also the transformation of the person, for instance a non-member to a member of a community. More generally, learning is transformational of identity and becoming a certain kind of person is what gives meaning to learning. Recently I was talking with some researchers in medical education in Vancouver and for them viewing medical education as a transformation of identity was very important. Going from I'm just a regular citizen to I'm a doctor. But they were saying that traditional medical education is very focused on information and skills and there's very little support or discussion about how students actually are going to transform from I'm a regular citizen to a person who's going to be able to give care to others. In this way, having a theory such as the community of learners, the community of practice theory, as a way to talk about this transformation was extremely useful. In this course, one of the ways we're going to be building a community of learners is through our discourse. And really, discussion is a very useful tool for learning. When it's designed properly and used thoughtfully, discussion tasks can be an effective learning tool that promote creativity and generate meaningful interaction and understanding. Well-designed discussion tasks lead to progressive knowledge-seeking inquiry or expansion where learners are actively synthesizing new information with prior knowledge and experience in the process of creating not only new knowledge but new understandings of their learning process. And this is based on the work of Scalameria and Baritter or Angus Strom. And you can see here there's also another link about learning through discussions. In our course, much of our discussions will come as a jumping off point from the video clips through our analysis questions, our synthesis questions, and we'll jump off those in our tutorials and spend time talking about the topic area. And then, in order to have some time to critically reflect, to take some time to ponder and pull together your thinking around the topic area, we have our asynchronous discussion tasks as well within this course. So the graphic on the slide is a very quick overview on the emphasis of discussion and discourse in the, in the whole program, but as well as in this course. So you're talking about it. You're listening to the videos. You've got the advanced organizers that are the analysis questions. Then you post your initial thoughts in the discussion forum. You think. You, you reflect on them, your thoughts. You reflect on your thoughts by reading others' posts and what they took away from the very same content. And then you respond either in the discussion forum or through our tutorials and we talk some more. And this is a cyclical process. One of the other pieces that you will find perhaps slightly different than your experience in um, other higher ed courses is the focus on authentic assessment. So throughout this program and certainly within the nature of this course, um, the assessments here are focused on real-world tasks that demonstrate meaningful application of essential knowledge and skills. And you can see that in the assessment rubric, you can see that in the assessment descriptions and how the assignments are described. And the main takeaway from this piece here for you is that these tasks, the work that you're doing in this course, is not a make-work project. It needs to be meaningful, it needs to be relevant to you, and you need to be able to mold it and use it in your setting. So in the context of this course, one way we achieve this is through the problem-based learning um, experiences that you'll be going through, as well as the final assignment, which is a briefing note. And in our discussions and our tutorials, that's where people will provide examples of how they use this in their setting or challenges of applying some of the topics that we're discussing in their setting. And that's where our learning really, really cultivates. The self-assessment of your involvement, contribution, and role in the problem-based learning experiences is also a form of authentic assessment. It provides you that opportunity to stop, reflect on your role, reflect on your contribution, what you would change, what you would modify for the next time, and through that, deepen your learning. 
This is a sample assessment rubric. This is one taken from our course, and it is the one for self-assessment. And you can see the indicator is on the left-hand column, the criteria in the middle, and the rating on the right. Um, this is just one example of the rubric. There are others in our course as well. But this really gives you a sense of what are we focusing on uh, when we're assessing, in your case, in this case, your self-assessment, um, of your work in the PBL. So those are the indicators. And th what criteria are we using to decide whether or not we did it well um, or whether we have areas to improve? And those are right in the middle there. So in the course outline and in Blackboard, you'll see these are rubrics. They're different for each assessment um, or each assignment item, uh, but they're there and they're, their purpose is to help clearly define what the requirements are for the assignment and how the assignment will be assessed. So you should be able, going into submitting your assignment, have a very good sense of where you've met the requirements uh, or where there might be areas to improve. And those are just some examples of the differences that you may see in this course from your more uh, traditional or your stereotypic uh, higher education course. And so when you're trying to wrap this all together, when you're thinking about what questions you might bring forward to the tutorial this week, think about some of these synthesis questions. Why is it important for everyone to participate in discussion? And why would you use authentic assessment? What are the differences in the learning environment when you're looking at a PBL, a problem-based learning course, as opposed to more of a, a lecture style or didactic approach to teaching and learning? And why is a non-traditional format a good choice for this course and for this program? So I'll leave you with those to ponder, and I look forward to speaking with you further in our discussions this week. Thank you.